Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, Maginot Line. Uh, I've been to a part of this. Uh, but I think they should have extended it through Belgium. Uh, I know it would have soured relations with Belgium and whatnot, but you're you're leaving a wide weak point open. Maybe I'll, I'll be proven wrong here. Uh, my name's Connor. If you're new, I like to learn about history and stuff and watch things. Hit all the buttons. Uh, let's go. After the First World War, the French wanted to make sure that their eastern border would not be overrun by yet another attack from German lands. And what is a famous way of keeping invaders out? Build a wall. So build India. a wall they did. Make the Germans pay for it. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is a World War II on location special. After World War I, the French were determined to never again have a war on open ground in their own territory. So the idea was to stop the enemy at the border. A variety of plans to fortify the Franco-German border are born already during the Great War, and plans are discussed more or less immediately after the 1918 armistice. Already during the early 1920s, increased fortifications on select points along the border are under construction. By 1925, the idea of a coordinated line of physical defense works has matured into a project to create a literal wall of fortifications along the whole line of the German border. It is these fortifications directly west of Germany, right here behind me, that have gone into history as the Maginot Line. Uh, I He'll get in, into it if, if it's the case, but I wonder, um, is it just one heavily fortified line or, or were there kind of like one or two or three in case they got past the first one? I'm thinking of, uh, I, I learned in another video about, you know, the, there are the Soviet defenses in World War II that um, was like the Maginot line on steroids and they had like, gaps in between like three successive walls and um i don't think the french did the same thing but let's see named after the french minister of war andre maginot who presides over the project starting in 1928. in reality though the maginot line is much more than that because it denotes a series of fortifications running south to north from the alpine border with italy all the way to the english channel but as we shall see, the complexity of building such a series of fortifications is not just an engineering feat of some magnitude, but a political, foreign relations, and financial challenge too. Hazards Understood. that will leave this grand project full of gaps large enough for the entire Wehrmacht to slip through into France in a matter of days in May 1940. To be fair, even if they did um, extend it... Um, to the Atlantic, the, 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 the plan by the Germans was to punch through the Ardennes, which I learned was thought to be pretty uh, impenetrable forests and, and hills, if not mountain area, on the border between France and um, Germany, where they, they did not consider to put much fortifications anyway. And so extending this to the Atlantic would still leave that vulnerable and they would still end up choosing that as the invasion point and maybe it wouldn't have mattered let me know if i'm contrary wrong. to popular belief these Bones gaps away. are not in the fortifications themselves though but i'll get back to that in a bit okay. the knee-jerk reaction immediately after the war to make sure germany will not cross the border again is the occupation of the rhineland sorry guys i'm pausing too much but i i think i've been there i'm almost certain that that's the thing the, the guy with the horse on the statue with the horse um, you can walk up both sides there. They're, they're on this cliff right here. And I, I believe there's a gondola now when I was there that goes all up to here. I just wanted to point out. Sorry, I've been pausing a lot. I'm going to go back like war. 10 Tell seconds. Still, but I'll get back to that in a bit. The knee-jerk reaction immediately after the war to make sure Germany will not cross the border again is the occupation of the Rhineland as per the Treaty of Versailles. But this arrangement will end in 1935, and until then, another solution is needed. In 1922, the CDT, the Committee for Territorial Defense, is called together, first under leadership of Joseph Joffre, retired general and former chief of staff of the French army, and then, starting in 1925, by General Adolphe Guillaumont, commander of the Allied occupation forces in the Rhineland. 
The master plan that evolves hinges on the idea that the enemy must be slowed down or even halted right behind the border long enough for full mobilization and deployment of the French. So it is not the defense works that are the end plan. The principle that they eventually agree on is that the war will only be won by the maneuverability of the army and the advance attack on the adversary. So again, contrary to popular belief, it is not the case that the French strategists are stuck with the idea of a Great War-style stagnant front. And they learned from captured German World War I fortifications that a strong defensive perimeter can slow down the enemy significantly to give time for that counterattack. Okay, so the, it, that's kind of putting down the assumption that this shows how the French were completely unaware of how warfare was changing and they expected a, a perfect um, redo of, of trench warfare. They, they weren't expecting that. They were just using it as, as a buffer. The basic plan of the Maginot Line... That looks exactly like where I want... It's not. I can tell it's not with the trees. But that's... One of these is exactly like what, what we stumbled upon. ...was to resist 20 days to avoid a blitz attack coming from Germany or Italy and to oblige the enemy coming through Belgium because the French wanted the help of the British army and we wanted to pass through Belgium to enter into the Ruhr in Germany. Um, see, that's very interesting that you say that it was designed to hold them for 20 days. 20 right? days. Because a lot of people think, oh, it's designed to be an impregnable wall that nobody could break through. CDT's first practical step is an extensive survey of the French eastern borders north of the Alps to assess what is needed. They start putting together a mixed plan for defense works based on the terrain, tactical considerations, distance to the German border, and technical possibilities. As Mussolini rises to power, they increase the area to include the border all the way down to the Mediterranean, Corsica, and French Tunisia in North Africa. In 1925, after three years of work, they've settled on an extensive strategic plan. Although they do weigh the possibility of relying on the Benelux countries and Switzerland as bulwarks and debate how a defense in those areas might affect relations with those neighbors, in the end, they decided that the construction plan must include those borders too. However, here they also assume that the French army and probably allied Britain, will enter into those countries and stall an attack before it hits the line. Moreover, the Franco-Belgian border is more navigable than the forests, steep hills, and mountains further south. They conclude that a counterattack in this area will be easier and can be done by greater force. Moreover, the firing lines there are more open, so a casemate, bunker, or fort in that area can cover much more ground than in the choppier terrain of the Ardennes, stretching down into Lorraine and Alsace. The fairly easy to defend, relatively flat and open area of the littoral and Lille sector will be based on field defenses, categorized as level zero defenses. The Esco and Mauberge sectors are a major entry point from Belgium and will have the Heard second that. highest defense level too and be protected by four ouvrages or underground forts. The Ardennes sector will also depend on field defenses as the terrain makes it practically impossible to cross with tanks or artillery at that point. This is, by the way, also not where the Germans come through in 1940, as that is, in fact, not possible. What? South of there is the Montmédy sector around Sedan and Montarmé. Although still in the Ardennes here, it is theoretically possible to cross, and the fortifications are again level two, with four forts, two of them with heavy artillery capability. The Marville sector is planned with field fortifications and level zero defense works because of terrain. The Krune, Thionville, and Boulay sectors around Metz are planned with heavy level three defense works, as entry here through the southern tip of the Benelux countries and directly from Germany can be swift and sudden. No less than 33 fortifications of varying sizes will protect these sectors, the heaviest fortification of the line north of the Alps. 14 of these forts. I had to go back just to get a double take. Be so they didn't go through the Ardennes? ...will have heavy artillery. The Falquemont and Sarret sectors provide fairly good natural defenses and will be protected mainly by field defenses. Gaps in the natural defense will be blocked off by six forts. The Rohrbach, Vosch, and Hagenau sectors 
also directly on the German border, will be fortified at level 3 with 10 forts, 7 of which will have heavy artillery. The three sectors on the natural mountainous border with Switzerland will depend on field defenses, while the entire Alpine border with Italy, down to the Mediterranean, will be level 3 and contain 53 fortifications, almost half of them with heavy artillery. Corsica and French Tunisia will be protected against a possible Italian invasion by a series of blockhouses and field defense works. In 1929, they're ready to go into construction. French Minister of War André Maginot presents the plans to Parliament and asks for 2.9 billion francs in appropriations for the project. His plan is approved with 90% of Parliament votes. Construction starts immediately in 1930. The construction takes place under extreme secrecy, with only French companies allowed to be contracted, and all workers have rigorous security and background checks. By 1933, 26,000 men are working on the sites. It is tough and dangerous work, with cave-ins, accidental explosions, and other mishaps killing dozens of workers over the years. They start by digging and mining their way into the rock to create the space they need for the underground constructions. Some of the blocks will reach 17 meters into the ground, have up to 3.5 meters, that's like 12 feet thick, walls, and require 30,000 cubic meters, like 1.1 million cubic feet, of super strength armored concrete. In total, they will construct 46 major artillery fortresses, half of them north of the Alps. 97 infantry fortresses armed with anti-tank artillery and machine guns, 36 of them in the north. 342 casemates armed with mortars, machine guns, and anti-tank guns, 308 of those are in the north, as well as a number of observation posts and bunkers. The underground fortresses will have independent capacity to fire above ground through bunker slits and vertically extendable turrets, armed with a variety of guns. Things are like an anthill. I, I didn't realize how far down they went. From machine guns to 75 and 88 millimeter artillery. The artillery forts will have cannons between 75 and 135 millimeter caliber. Many of the gun positions will be exchangeable. It doesn't seem like they can rotate this is very... This my right eye dominant. Okay. If I put my shoulders, my right eye's on it. It's imagine a line. Everything's super technology. Watch. If you undo this bolt, you turn this through 180 degrees, now when I put my shoulders on, it's my left eye to the side. In total, they construct oh, 152 cool. raisable revolving turrets that operate okay. from deep under the ground. We're in, we're in the lower level of, yeah. of block two, and this is the mixed arm turret. Right. So what we're seeing, the weight of the turret is resting on this part here. Right. This is the counterbalance arm and this is the counterweight in its in its well in its pit okay. this is the balance point or fulcrum and it simply takes two revolutions to lift the turret up or down it only goes up or down about this much okay originally it was armed with two 75 millimeter artillery pieces right. they changed the armament to two armor mixed anti-tank gun with two machine guns because this was to have two grow ouvrage one on each side so if we now go up, <coughs> running through what we've got here. Left, right traverse is two men turning the handles. Right. He can change it with a bit like a cl clutch mechanism. And <coughs> running through what we've got here. Left, right traverse is two men turning the handles. Right. He can change it with a bit like a cl clutch mechanism from fast to slow, rapid to long. Yes. Now, it's missing, but previously he could turn a handle for fine tuning of the rotation of the turret. To give orders, yeah. this weapon system sat in this cradle with the gunner beneath it. So he's got two control arms yeah. to move left and right, up and down, because the end of the barrel is in the ball mounting here. Sure. So the two gun systems fire independently. In between, we've got the housing for the periscope that came out and looked in the middle. <laughs> yep. The two holes here are for spent ammunition. Okay. There was a tube that came out the back of the weapon system yeah. that was nearly vertical and dropped down, so all the spent ammunition went down, because they didn't want any gas for it. Yeah, I got you. That's, uh, that's one. 
Pretty tight system. Genius. Dozens of factories are at work constructing the complicated parts for the turrets, or putting turrets from World War I back into working condition. They use steel that has been specially developed to withstand modern warfare. In fact, it will turn out that the heavy armor can withstand direct grenade hits even by an 88mm grenade shell coming in at a 90 degree angle. The fortresses will operate in groups of three to five that are interconnected by tunnels, walkways, and crawlways. Some of them will even have narrow gauge railways. That's crazy. What we really wanted to do was give you an idea of the massive scale of this, of how... See, I wasn't able to go inside where it, it was locked, it, it was gated, and it didn't look... It might have not even... We might have even been able to open it, but you wouldn't want to go inside. Like, it was very dark. It, it was not... did not look like this. Pretty sure it was gated anyway. But it would have been cool to go in. How large this, this really is. I mean, even from one end of here if to the other, that's over a kilometer that you have to walk or roll or something, right? Oh, when we do the complete tour of the Fort Schoenenburg, yeah. you walk three kilometers. That's just, that's just a tour of this fort. This mm -hmm. fort. There are many forts. So. All the galleries in the Maginot Line, it's a total of 100 kilometers underground galleries. They were all connected with telephone cable, as you said. And there was also the TSF, 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 I love how they've gotten a, a British guy to talk, French guy to talk, and now, now they've got the German. Strom erzeugen. Das waren die Stromerzeuger vom Werk. Aber die Maschinolinie, jeder Bunker von der Maschinolinie, der war ja versorgt vom Hauptnetz mit einem großen Kabel. Ah, ja. Und diese Motoren, die sind ja bloß im Fall eines Falles. Das waren im Notfall, konnte man diese Motoren. Also, hier befinden wir uns im Filterraum. Denn als sie damals die Maginolinie gebaut haben, haben sie ja immer noch die Psychose von der Gase von 14, 18 gehabt. Noch. Und deswegen haben sie auch in jeder Bunker, aber je nach Größe, eine Menge Filter eingebaut. Kohle, Kohle und gerade Filter. Und mehr war es nicht. Das Problem aber, wie damals war, weil... Right, because uh, like they would design mustard gas and whatever other gas, uh, you know, chemicals agents that they'd use in um you know gas warfare in world war one it, it was de designed to like sink and so if there were any open holes and there was a gas it would all kind of pour in i'm guessing so they needed filtration obviously falls ein gras angriff gekommen wäre hier man hatte damals die bunker nie hermetisch schließen können an der türe die skischächte die waren ja nicht dicht und yeah. deswegen hat man innen drin einen kleinen Überdruck von 300 oh, cool. Millibar entstehen lassen, um die Luft, die eindringende Luft wieder Sehr abzudrücken. Schlau. Between the forts, the casemates and bunkers will be set up in patterns, so they cover the entire defensive perimeter that they oh, protect. That Entry to the forts and casemates oh, will be by the between sites. the forts. The casemates and bunkers will be set up in patterns, so they cover the entire defensive perimeter that they protect. Entry to the forts and casemates will be limited to one door, protected by armored doors, moats, and guard posts that can even operate in close combat from inside. But there will also be emergency exits for worst case scenarios. Okay, if there was great danger, and as a last resort, you might find yourself right here. What's this? This is the secret emergency exit. Yep. And uh, only the commandant of the fortress had the key. So you couldn't just go out yourself? Uh, no, okay. it's no, no. not possible. We are uh, 30 meters deep, 100 okay. feet. And at that place, from outside, we are uh, hidden in the forest. Well, it's cool that you've got a back, a back door, you know, a okay. secret back door. You can enter, it's impressive. It is? Okay. Okay, now this doesn't look like somewhere you'd exit from. So how does it work? It works. We have here uh, a tube. Yeah. Uh, the tube is uh, 22 meters high. Yeah. It's filled with gravel and sand. Okay. And if you have to go out, from outside here, you climb um, at the level, yeah. you open a mechanism, the gravel falls in this room. Yeah. It frees um, a ladder, okay, here, and you can climb. And you can climb outside. up, and they cannot that's follow great. you. I mean, no. that's, you're, I hope it. But yeah, that's, you're, that's, from the yeah. tube, you have 22 meters free. Yeah, but if you've got to run away and somebody's following you, then this is this is where you want to go. 
contrary to the German West Wall that will rely on depth to act as an impact zone to slow down the enemy, the Maginot Line is truly a single line running some 6 to 16 kilometers behind the border, 25 kilometers at its deepest point. In front of it are minor bunkers and outlook posts that are only expected to act as a first point of contact so that the line can activate. Understood. The mission was to resist 20 days. Right. And uh, you have two light lines of the Maginot line from the border and the fortress Chenambourg and uh, the other big fortress and Kazmat mm -hmm. are the main uh, resistance line. Okay. And uh, when you pass that, you pass. For that to work, this means that the forts and casemates have to be manned constantly. The forts are practically little villages underground. Its stores hold thousands of tons of frozen meat and 500 million gallons of red wine. Okay, so where are we now? This is obviously a the barrack wine. of some sort. Yes, yeah. it's a sleeping room for 36 soldiers. 36 12, people in this size room. 12, 12, 12, wow. and they are obliged to stay here during three days. It's one quarter of the uh, soldiers, yeah. three of the soldiers are in the combat blocks, one yeah. kilometer from here, and one is here, and every three, three days they change. Okay. And they stay Ooh. here for 300 days. Yeah, that's... Uh... When the men are rotated out of their frontline positions, they're housed further back from the front, at first in regular barracks. In 1933, though, when Hitler seizes power, the increased threat level pushes the government to ask for an additional 1.3 billion francs to build bunkers several kilometers behind the line to house enough soldiers in shelters for constant manning of the line. Despite all this money and manpower, it is at times not enough to complete all the plan. La Ferté originally was meant to be three blocks. It's all Maginot equipment, but they ran out of money and so it wasn't constructed as it should be. There is no separation of function. This is a combat area. It's a cloche. It fires. That's where the men sleep. There are 50 men in this block. There's no separation between the men sleeping, living down below protected and the combat area where the fighting is. So when there were the explosive charges men dropped down room. from the cloche above, the explosive charges destroyed this wall. This hole, this gaping hole, where there should, should have been a wall with the concrete on the floor, this is not a structural wall. This wall is only here to keep this part in overpressure so that any gases are pushed out. So when there were explosions here, this wall just disintegrated. And in fact, you can see how it must have injured some of the men lying yeah. on the beds. And straight away, there were explosions, there's fire because the fuel required for the motors was just stacked all over the place because there's no place to right. store it underground. Death trap. So it just went catastrophically wrong in, in seconds or minutes. Now, the Germans couldn't have known that this one no. wasn't set. So it was just luck that they picked it. It was one. kind of bad luck. Yeah. Okay. The Germans didn't know, no. When Germany's rearmament seems an inevitable fact, in 1935, Maurice Gamelin, then Minister of War, pushes through a major improvement of the line. He uses the now extended two-year mandatory military service to have the army start improvement works and extensions. He sets aside 5,000 conscripts to construct 4,400 new bunkers to fill out the line with stronger fortified infantry positions to give mobile armored divisions the support they need to attack through the line. I feel like a second line, I know it's asking for a lot, you know, you, oh, just build a whole new uh, separate line, but I feel like a, like a, a two-line defense would be more than twice as good as a one-line defense because if they're able to be, um, you know, weakened by the front line and eventually capture it, they're going to be like twice as vulnerable to that second line. And, you know, the sum I think would be greater than, than the, the parts of just the two lines. Out of these bunkers, 3,300 are built I, north of the Alps. I know it's easier said than done. With the highest concentration in the areas with level 0 to 2 defenses. This is where the problems start, though. Instead of carrying through on that plan by supplying the needed forces, the French army generals start quibbling about who gets what, fail to implement a functioning armored division command structure, and set up plans that at times 
seem to completely ignore the existence of their formidable, extensive, and very expensive defense line. In some places, the works ordered by Gamelon are only carried out at a slower than required pace. One of these places is critical. It's the line at Sedan. And the man in charge there is General Charles Hunziger, who you see more of in our May 18th, 1940 double-length episode. Well, okay, other episodes too. Then we will also see if the line holds, and if it does, what other things go wrong. This episode was made possible by special donations from our community. This enabled us to go to France and film on location. So thank you very much to all who contributed. To do this again in the future, we will need your long-term participation as well. So do not forget to join the Time Ghost Army on Patreon. See you next time. Awesome videos, like always. Indian Night Owl is great. But it really is made, this video is really making it seem like uh, the Maginot Line is one of the biggest military blunders or just wastes in, in, in history. Just you spend all this time and all this money, and then it's just so swiftly avoided by, by the Wehrmacht and uh, <laughs> military fail, I, I would say, of the highest order. Awesome video. Um, great channel. World War II, The Great War, Time Goes History. He's on Sabaton History all the time. Indy Nidell is just on all these great channels. And for good reason. He, he's a great host. All right. See you guys next time. I'll be doing the greatest raid of all time tomorrow. Or I'll be posting this tomorrow morning. So a few hours after this is posted, I'll do that. See you next time.